Tech Yoskaya. I work at the Software Engineering Institute, Carnegie Mellon. I'm one of the guest editors of IEEE Software Magazine's special issue on technical debt. Today I'll be talking to Michael Feathers, a member of the technical staff at Groupon, about his experience with technical debt. Prior to joining Groupon, Michael was the chief scientist of Optiva and a senior consultant with Object Mentor International. Over the years, Michael has spent a great deal of time helping teams alter design over time in code bases. Michael is also the author of a very well-known book, Working Effectively with Legacy Code, published by Prentice Hall in 2004. Thanks a lot for your time today, uh, Michael, in talking to me about uh, your experiences with technical debt. You have worked in several organizations, both as a consultant and leading architecting and development efforts. What have you observed? Is technical debt a useful metaphor? Are developers and software engineers generally aware of the concept? Uh, yeah, they seem to be. It's, um, it's a very funny term, technical debt, because when it was originally coined, um, the idea was to basically talk about uh, uh, things that development teams took on voluntarily in order to achieve a short-term short goal, kind of short-term methods that they created uh, in order to um, achieve a goal and then kind of clean it up and move forward. Uh, but the thing is that you know, there is this other aspect of technical debt, which is really the unintentional methods that we create along the way. Um, it seems that the term technical debt has basically taken on more of that meaning uh, in the past couple of years. Um, and I, I see people using the term frequently because of that. So is debt like a uh, debt in real life? Do you think it can be measured in dollars or other financial measures? Well, I think the metaphor breaks down at a certain point. The thing about debt is that you can, you know, in monetary debt, you can basically put like a fixed number on it. The thing I think is kind of awkward with what we um, refer to as debt in software is that so much of what we, um, the way that it impacts us really depends upon the features that we're going to be adding into our software over time, right? So we may have some messy areas of our code basis right now, and they may not actually affect us in any concrete way until we need to go and change them. Uh, so in that sense, you can see it as being um, kind of like a variable cost depending upon future work. And uh, that's one thing that makes it a little bit different. So uh, it's also kind of hard to come down to like a, a strict dollars and cents thing for debt, you know, software debt because of that. Again, as I mentioned, it just really depends all on what you need to do next within the code base. Mm -hmm. So is it, uh, I, you bring a, uh, one of the uh, interesting perspectives, as you suggested when Ward Cunningham uh, used the term, it was mostly referring to a strategic decision, whereas over the years it has really taken on the uh, nature where a lot of low quality or things that happen for good reason that accumulated in the software has become associated with technical debt. And in that sense, is it then really debt that uh, an organization is incurring or is it uh, more of a, I guess, future maintenance cost that uh, you observe? Uh, because you seem to bring that perspective into the notion more than the strategic one. Uh, well, yeah, from my point of view, I, I think that it's something that we don't really think about often enough in software development that um, as uh, code base becomes more complicated, um, it basically incurs a higher cognitive load as you're going to be making changes to it. Um, and as a result, it's, it's very much like entropy or friction on future development, uh, to mix metaphors. Um, I think those things are all very real, and uh, we don't spend enough time thinking about them. We tend to believe that... Uh, the amount of time that it takes to add certain features to the basis is relatively fixed across the life cycle, and it doesn't seem to be. You know, it seems that there, uh, you know, there is variation depending upon the state of the code that we are confronting. And um, I feel also that those, uh, that aging in software is something that we don't really know enough about, or at least I don't uh, see enough reference to it. Um, I think that. For practitioners, that's really something that we should be able to go and accept as ground zero. We should um, understand that um, decisions we make early will affect later decisions. And uh, even though we are able to refactor, you know, there are certain things that will be of higher cost uh, later in the life cycle. Uh, I think, yeah, I, those are the um, thoughts I have about that. Mm -hmm. 
So in your experience, uh, are there repeatable quantifiable engineering practices that organizations can follow to manage technical debt, especially because you mentioned that we don't pay enough attention to some of the uh, aspects that occur with the natural entropy and the aging of the systems? Well, one thing I find valuable is to actually um, take particular uh, stories or features that people want to add to a code base and estimate them uh, at different points in time over the um, uh, over the life cycle of the product. And these uh, might be hypothetical features, but uh, actually in, in cases that I do this, I basically do use hypothetical features occasionally so that we can see what the cost of adding something atypical into the code base might be um, and how that does vary over time. Uh, it's a rather strange practice, but it gives some kind of like a, a bellwether to uh, the amount of um, uh, the amount of friction we might um, encounter when um, adding unexpected features in the code base. Um, when you have that, typically one of the things you can do is pay a lot more attention to separation of concerns in your work. Um, when you do that, it tends to go and make um, unexpected features a bit easier to add. Uh, but it's one of those things that's not readily observable in code bases. You quite often have to go and, uh, in essence, measure, measure the code against um, unexpected use cases in order to go and get a sense of what that might be. I think that actually uh, brings an interesting point because a lot of the work that we observe in this area with the measurement perspective looks at the code in a static time, but uh, looking at it with the same uh, feature over time actually could create a, a more objective comparative basis. So thanks for sharing that uh, sure. insight with us. Bring it, it all uh, together. So if we argue that natural software evolution and aging results in a form of technical debt, in, the, in that regard, then are we arguing technical debt is unavoidable? Um, I think one aspect of technical debt is unavoidable. You know, if we, if we see technical debt as software aging, which seems to be the way that people are using the term uh, more and more these days, uh, yeah, I think to a degree, um, yeah, some of these things are unavoidable. Uh, just for historical perspective, though, I came into the industry before you know the Agile um, movement and got involved with it quite heavily when it first came across. And uh, we did have a we did recognize that basically through refactoring and a lot of um, automated testing, we can basically maintain uh, uh, nimbleness in the code base, you know, for a good period of time. Um, that all tends to work, but I feel that with software, it's very much uh, it's very much organic, like the growth of the tree, for instance. It's kind of like there are certain decisions you make early on, okay, in the life cycle of software, which do tend to go and basically make other decisions harder or other courses harder to take later in the life cycle. And um, I think that with awareness of those things, um, we can develop incrementally and um, preserve, you know, a great deal of uh, flexibility in our software. But there is there is that thing, since software development does feel kind of organic or kind of biological, um, early decisions will affect later decisions. And that's just a very natural consequence of, I think, incremental growth in any system. Uh, so I, I'm not one to go and believe that we should go and design everything in exquisite detail up front, uh, but we do need to be aware of the, um, uh, the scope of uh, possibilities that we are um, um, foreclosing or enabling um, when we make early decisions in our software. I think the uh, point you bring up uh, combines uh, the movement in the architecture, uh, especially software architecture research camp. In the past couple of years, there has been actually a big push in terms of taking the architecture decision view in terms of managing the architecture over time. And technical debt actually highlights the importance of that uh, even more significantly, as you uh, pointed out uh, very clearly. That brings me to my last question today, Michael, which is, so where does the metaphor start breaking? Is there value in formalizing the concept and pushing forward in utilizing it, creating measurement or practice-related uh, work around it so that teams can track their technical debt separate from other software development tasks, or should it just stay as a metaphor and we should leave it alone and continue doing the practices and applying the practices as we've already been doing? Well, I think debt is a very powerful word, and it's also a word with very wide applicability. Um, I, 
I think I'm going to dodge your question a little bit because I'm not really sure, you know, which way things should go with this. Um, I do feel, though, that quantifying debt is something that uh, we can't just sort of like do in a fixed way. We can't say this particular code has this amount of debt, for instance. It's always relative to future decisions. And um, then that means essentially that, uh, you know, debt in this usage is more like a, a portfolio of possibilities. Um, if we go in one direction or another direction or another direction, um, we have various costs depending upon the current state of the code. And um, so I, I'm not sure about whether it's the best metaphor going forward. I think it's, it's very useful at the point of conversation. In terms of quantification, I don't know if another metaphor might be better. Uh, I suspect that that's possible. Mm -hmm. well, uh, thanks a lot for your insights. I especially appreciate the uh, architecture decision uh, perspective and their uh, dependencies, both the past and future decisions because that's an area that uh, actually starts becoming interesting, especially with quantification, and also very challenging yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Oh, that's all I have. Thanks a lot, Michael.